Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show, and I'm so very glad you're here. I love this series. I just love it. I love it almost as much as my two guests today. We're in a series called For the Love of Peace. Um, I don't think I need to explain that. We're just in need of it right now. We're in need of it always, but certainly this time of year and certainly just with the world right now. And so we really wanted our show to be a place of like rest and respite and peace here at the end of the year. Now, I think you know how special it is for me when I have guests back on the show for a second or even a third time, um, because then we get to go more in depth on topics we started discussing the first time, um, but have way more places to keep going. And then of course we get to know our guests better. Um, we get to ask questions that we ran out of time to f- the first go around. So that is today. You, I hope you remember our guests, Sal and M. We had them on the show a little over two years ago. They are hosts of the Good Morning Podcast and Morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, Good Morning Podcast. Um, they were on. They were in our Elephant in the Room series back in early 2022. Um, and they just are amazing. We love them. Your response to them the first time was really, really strong. This that particular episode charted really high. Um, and we always pay attention to that because that's you telling us what you want to hear. Um, so we are always, always noticing what has a lot of traction in our community, and they certainly did. And so as you know, obviously the whole point of the series is to bring a, a a sense of calm to the holiday season this year. But there is a specific group of people that need peace, maybe especially um, right now, and that is the grievers. So whether you've lost someone near and dear to you, and this is I don't know, maybe your first holiday season without them, or it could be that you're mourning a friendship or a relationship of some kind, or it could even be like the loss of a job or a dream or a place or any of it, really any loss that creates grief. It's, it almost feels doubly hard during the holidays, right? Where everyone's kind of expecting or even pretending that everything is to be filled with happiness when it isn't. And sometimes we are right in the middle of pain. And so we, we grief is normal and we deserve the time to grieve well and the way that we need to, and it absolutely can and does coexist with quote, the most wonderful time of the year. And so I'm so grateful to have Sal and M here again, to talk us through this, to empower us, to walk through the holidays in whatever state we're in and Help us navigate mourning when it feels like the whole world is rejoicing, right? So if if you didn't listen to our previous episode together, Sally Douglas and Imogene Karn, who go by Sal and M, met in 2019 after their mothers suddenly passed away just months apart. And the girls are young. Um, because of their shared grief experience, they met in a grief group. They decided to launch a podcast together and they have this super beautiful, like hard one relatable approach to grief and what it really feels like to deal with loss. And they've created a beautiful community around it. So Sal and M also, you guys released a book earlier this year called Good Morning, M-O-U-R-N again, Honest Conversations About Grief and Loss. And one of the reviews says this about it, a comforting support group in book form a must read for grievers, which is incredible. And they are a gift. They are a gift to us. I, I loved them the first go around and I remembered why today they are, um, earnest and, and approachable and honest and truthful and lovely. And, um, we're lucky to have them here. And so if you find yourself this year grieving in any way, and for any reason, this is for you. 
this is for you. And if you love someone who's, who was grieving, send this to them. I love you. And I'm so pleased to share my conversation with the absolutely wonderful Sal and M. All right, Sal and M, welcome back. I was just telling you before we started recording that the first time you were on the show, our listening community was like, wait a minute, we love them. We are obsessed. Thank you for introducing us. And onboarded a whole bunch of new fans into y'all's world because you're incredible. That's why. Oh, Jen, stop. That was on the introduction. It's so good to be back and it's so good to see you. We were just saying how much you are absolutely glowing at the moment and it's brilliant to see that. But thanks for having us back on your pod. Yes, yes, delightful. So listen, obviously we're going to have this video for people who want to watch us have a conversation over on YouTube, but for people who are just listening in their little AirPods, can you guys introduce yourselves so that, and and kind of the high level, like I'm, this is me and this is my deal, um, so they can recognize your voice as they listen to our conversation. Absolutely. So we're Sal and Im. And we are co-hosts of the Good Morning Podcast. And our aim is to normalize talking about grief. You have to tell everyone you're Sal, Sal, so they get That's who right. you are and who I'm I Sal, am. sorry. I'm That's Sal, right. uh-huh. one half of the Good Morning Podcast. That's right. And I am Im, the other half of the Good Morning Podcast. So our, our mums died suddenly. My mum died by suicide and Sal's mum died from a sudden seizure. And this was back in 2019 and early 2020. So we're coming into the fourth year of our grief now, which feels like a long time since we've yeah, experienced a significant loss. Mm. And we started the Good Morning podcast because we realized that people don't talk about grief, even though we all experience grief in some form. So our aim is to normalize talking about grief by making it really accessible and really conversational. Yeah, you guys, you're so good at doing that. And you're doing it in a way that not only makes room, of course, and space for people's grief and their losses and their actual human feelings, but you also do it in a way like, it's not all just like, it's not doom and gloom with you two. Like it isn't, you've done it in a way where you go, this is a part of life. It's not the only part of life, but it is a part of life. So how do we integrate it amongst the absurdity and the humor and the joy and the real stuff and the recovery? And it's brilliant. And I would love to hear it from both of you because you guys came on, was it two years ago? I think Um, maybe even a little bit longer than that. And so a lot has happened since then. Your influence has grown. Congratulations on your book. Your listening community is growing. So I would just like love to hear from each of you. This is what the last couple of years have looked like and what has changed and what has grown and and sort of where you both are in not just your work here, but also your own personal recovery process. You're right. It has been a little over two years, I think, yeah. since we spoke, which is wild. And in that time, we have been busy bees. We wrote a book. It's called Good Morning, Honest Conversations About Grief and Loss. And it's pretty much like a support group in a book. It's everything that we wish that we had in our hands when our mums died. And obviously, community is at the heart of everything we do, like you, Jen, as well. Community is so important to us. So we also included you know, lots of community stories within our book and shared other people's experiences because that was really important to us that it was able to reach all grievers, no matter what your loss is, no matter where you are at in your grief as well. Because as we talked about in our last episode with you, grief is a forever thing that we will carry with us, you know, for the rest of our lives. And we're really bloody proud of it. I have to say, like, it's been really well received And yeah, we're just really proud. And we've also just put out our 100th podcast episode, which is another huge milestone for us. And 100 podcasts, you guys, is no joke. Like that, the amount of hours that those 100 episodes represent, I know. I know what that means in terms of prep and research and recording and editing. And I, that is a, that is a labor of love to say nothing of writing a whole book. 
Um, and so you have worked really hard, really, really hard to bring this, um, to bear on your community and, and thank you for sharing it with mine. And I am just, this is me like, well done girls. I hope I'm glad to hear you say you're proud because you should be, um, Sal, what do you want to add to that? We've just been doing loads of talks and workshops. And like Im said, the book has been really well received and we get so many messages from people who have picked up the book randomly and said, oh my God, I did not know that everything that I was feeling is normal. And to us, that is exactly what we want to achieve. So yeah, it's such a proud feeling to know that we're making a difference. How did you girls find the writing process? Because writing a book is serious. I mean, it's it hard. Is. It is hard. It is hard. Like it's a great yeah. idea. You're like, oh yay, we get to write a book. And then you have to write it. Yeah. Like I you think, have to do the word part. Yes. I I think I had visions of, you know, just staring out the window and, and typing a few words and it all being a lovely process. It was, it was, it was hard. It was exhausting, uh, but it was also amazing. And it was such a good collaborative process. And uh, but it was definitely a real experience. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing quite like getting your precious little baby manuscript back from your editor for the first time and having it marked all up to be damned. And you are like, are you joking? Like I I have this, I have written, I don't it's like 14 books and the process never gets better or easier for me. And I have this, um, now I have this way of managing it where I know how those first marks are going to make me feel. And for those of you listening, the first round of edits that you get back from a manuscript, we're not talking about like this word is misspelled or this grammar is wrong. These are called developmental edits. And they're more like this whole chapter is garbage or this entire piece needs reworked, or I need a whole nother chapter to get me from this one to this one that you haven't yet written. I mean, they're huge. They're huge edits. And they're so overwhelming that now my process girls, and y'all just take this if you want it for your next book, is that I have decided when those come in, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to read every single edit in the entire manuscript, every one of them, no responding, I'm just going to read them. I'm just, how bad is it? Like, how bad is it? What are we in the ER? Are we just simply in the doctor's office? Like, how bad is it? And at that point, I understand that I cannot trust my feelings. And my feelings are things like, my editor is a bad person. She's a bad person. She's ter obviously terrible at her job and she should get another career. Also, she's mean. Also, they're probably all having talks about me behind my back. It's all, no, it's all hysterics. And so then I just decide I'm going to take a long walk. I'm going to take a walk for an hour. I'm going to close my laptop. I will not revisit any of this until tomorrow. And then the next day, the next morning, I'm like, I suppose that chapter could use a little massaging. Uh, the next day, I'm not quite so insane. Um, I'm not actively wishing harm on my editor anymore. I've decided she's not that bad. Um, and so anyway, if y'all ever need to do that again, that will get you through. It'll get you over the hump of the shot. I like, right? I like that. Thank you. I yeah. think we actually like, we had about two weeks to make the edits. And I think we rewrote the whole book, didn't we, Em? It was like. <laughs> we did. It was totally. actually our editors that were like, um, guys. What are you doing? can't be <laughs> making that many changes at the last, the final hour. We're like, I don't know when you do this. <laughs> so, and yeah, I don't probably, know, but let's just swap out us. a brand new 40,000 words <laughs> for these 40,000. Like, why not? Because grief um, changes so much, you know, one minute we're feeling this. The so next does our book. <laughs> yeah. oh, That's so true. That is so true. Well, congratulations on it. And however it got to the final product, it is a labor um, that you have to care deeply about in order to get through. And you did. And so I'm so happy to have you on right now because your work is always relevant. 365 days a year. Um, there's grief takes no holidays. It has no break. It's indiscriminate. Um, it will, it affects people by death, by disease, by divorce, by random lottery loss, by our own choices. It comes a million ways and it never ends. However, having said that it's the holiday season right now. And so for so many people, Grief feels extra hard right now. It it feels maybe even extra heavy. 
And so I am happy to have you here because I'd like to hear both of you talk about this right now. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to hear some of your recommendations um, for how to both hold and, and even perceive, even acknowledge our grief and our feelings in the middle of the kind of holiday hustle and bustle. Um, let's start like at the ground level, just your thoughts on grief and what it is like to have grief during this season. Where to start? And firstly, mm-hmm. thank you for acknowledging this because the festive season, you know, it's a time when there can be a lot of pressure to be put on a brave face to be happy and joyful but if you're experiencing any type of loss it's really hard and it can be really lonely and it can really amplify the things that you're missing it's really really tough and I think just giving yourself that permission to feel and you don't have to put on a brave face all the time it's about prioritizing your emotions and your needs And I think we talk about self-care a lot, but actually when you're grieving and going through a difficult time, it's about self-preservation and holding that space for yourself. And a really good thing to do, especially around this time of year, but when you're grieving in general is practicing boundaries, right? I think we've all probably been through difficult times when it comes to grief where we need to set boundaries. And that might be just not saying yes to every social invitation if you really don't have the energy or you don't feel up to it or not talking about your loss or your grief if you if you don't feel comfortable or not surrounding yourself with people who maybe are draining your energy or who aren't making you feel good about yourself just putting some of those boundaries in place to protect yourself because it can be extra draining at this time of year can't it Im? Absolutely draining. I think as well, Sal and I were pretty much the Grinch for the first couple of years after our mums died. And then you feel guilty for not getting in the festive spirit or letting other people down. And you can also feel like a bit of a burden. I definitely felt like a burden. So I think it's really important to honour wherever you're at and try not to judge yourself as well. You know, we just let ourselves be Grinches and slowly the joy did start to creep back in as the years went by. And then I, was it last year or the year before, Sal, we both went hmm, feeling a little festive this year and it felt a bit strange and almost wrong to be feeling that. But we we are big advocates of just trying not to judge where you're at and listening to your body as well. And if you feel like it wants to slow down or you just want to sleep for an entire day, even if it's Christmas Day, honor that and just let yourself be wherever you are in that moment without judging yourself. Mm, and I think I it's, love that. Yeah. It's so important. Like not to, if you don't want to do Christmas this year or you want to do it like, you know, the bare bones, that's absolutely fine. And just communicating that with those around you, you know, Hey, I'm just really not up to the celebrations this year. You know, I might just be a little bit low key, just letting people know, like Im said, like where you're at, because quite often it it does feel like an extra effort and sometimes we are just not up to it and that is absolutely okay give yourself the grace Mm. isn't it grief is so interesting because although it is uh, absolutely ubiquitous the most common shared human emotion we do all respond to it differently don't we I I um I don't know if you girls remember but I lost my 26 year marriage in the summer of 2020. And so right at the beginning of the pandemic, everything was just effed, like the whole world, my little family, nothing was good. Like there was just nothing good. And it's so interesting. I was in the abyss of grief. That's holiday season. I'd never, I mean, everything has been traditions, you know, like these, I just couldn't imagine. And I did the opposite y'all. I, I had a, I had a Christmas tree up in October. I, I overdid, I overdid. Like I, I was trying so hard to make some sort of experience for my kids that still felt uh, whatever. 
And even to, for my own self that, I mean, I, I it was, it was just, I, I was like a, a Hallmark movie, like on crack. And so if for me, it was the next year that I had to tell everybody last year was manic. I'm sorry. Um, this year, I don't have it in me. I had somebody come in and set up a tree the next year. We didn't do it ourselves. I paid somebody to come in and make my house look like something Christmassy. And I paid them to come take it out. I'm like, I don't have it in me to do any of this. And it it came in an interesting wave for me. And so I appreciate you saying, be gentle with yourself, whatever your response is. Like... <laughs> Whether you steer too hard into the curve and then have to correct after, or you just go low and still right away, grief does weird things in us, doesn't it? It makes us respond in ways that aren't typical, whatever typical is. I don't know. Yeah, have you ever over responded to your grief? Because that apparently was my move. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like when my mom died, I just went hell for leather with the, you know, planning and I was kind of like in, like, you know, organizer mode like to the uh, to the most extreme degree but thank you for sharing your experience there because I think that is important to acknowledge that not everyone might want to bed down some people might really seek that connection and want to feel a sense of normality or structure or you know uh, feel like they, they, they've still got a similar Christmas routine or sense of festivity so that's also important if that's what you need and you need to be around people and you need to have that sense that things haven't changed or that you, you know, that you you're holding yourself in a similar way. That's also OK, I think, as long as you are. Prioritizing yourself, that's mm -hmm. the main thing. I also love what? that you mentioned yep, this, Jen, because we hear a lot from grievers in our community that the second year is harder than the first year and that can take a lot of people by surprise because we always hear about the year of first and so we anticipate that all the firsts are going to be harder but what it sounds like that you were going through was probably you were in a lot of shock as well you know and it takes a long time to even process such a significant loss that's happened in your life and so, you know, for Sal and I, we were definitely in so much shock that first year. And then the second year, the reality did start to sink in a little more and the permanency of it. And then that's when you just, yeah, for us, we we started to really, you know, sink into a heavy grief then. So, yeah, I love that you talked about that because, again, the timeline of grief as a society, we don't do very well. You know, we, we give ourselves probably two weeks after the funeral or whatever the loss is to go back to normal when that just isn't the reality for many of us. That's right. Um, going back to that idea of boundaries, which is so important and poorly practiced by most of us. I, I only have a, I can only count probably on one hand, the number of friends I, I can think of that are actually really good at this. And so do you even have, I, I don't even know, maybe this isn't a fair question. Let's just say like, teeny little sentences or a teeny little script to use for people who go, I need boundaries. I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't know how to make them. I don't know how to adjust expectations with my mom or even with my own children. Or um, is there any sort of advice you can give us in terms of try this, try this sentence on for size when you are setting boundaries, maybe for the first time? Absolutely. So maybe it's somebody that is talking about your loved one that's passed away and you're finding it really emotionally draining. You could say something like, I need you to know that I need you to not talk about the person around me right now because I'm struggling. And the boundary is about asserting your need right? That's the most important thing. So when you are setting a boundary, you need to let the person know what you need. So maybe it's um, that you are taking on all of the load when it comes to all of the planning for Christmas and you're exhausted because grief is exhausting physically as well as emotionally. Maybe your partner's not doing their fair share or you need some help. It's as simple as I'm struggling right now with my energy levels and I need your help with the Christmas planning. Great. Simple. It doesn't have to be a dissertation. 
No. You don't even have to like over explain why it is that you need what you need, but just clarity around that you do and why. Yeah. Yeah. And being really, really clear, firm and Mm. asserting your need basically. Mm. And it's a learning too. boundaries. Like I think easy, are they? No, Mm. after our mums died, we realized we were pretty much chronic people pleasers, you know, and, and that's taught us to just listen to what we need and feel okay to be able to let people know if we're not comfortable with something or if we're struggling, we often don't want to let other people down to the detriment of our own, you know, mental health. Um, so I think it's really important to practice setting boundaries. Everyone should be doing it. It's such a healthy thing, but I think, I don't know, the generation we grew up in, they weren't very good at helping us with setting those boundaries. And here totally. we are whole, you know, yeah. I think it's something we've pleasing. only really come to talk about like in recent years, we actually have a whole chapter in our book on it because grief any type of loss it can feel overwhelming it can be all consuming as you know Jen like you just mentioned it can be just it's the magnitude of it people don't realize it's all consuming and then life carries on right you've still got you know a household to run kids to care for you know a job to be done bills to pay but then on top of that we're coping with grief and that's really overwhelming and so something that can really help as well is having an idea of your we like to call it like an energy budget but thinking about what's gonna you know you've got a hundred let's say a hundred coins in your energy jar that's your budget for the day what is going to take up the most so say you've got like a family dinner you know that that's probably going to take like 50 coins mm. and just managing at least. it that way at least <laughs> yeah if not Fair minimum it might bankrupt um, that jar to be honest <laughs> yeah. yes because then that yeah. can help you prioritize what boundaries you can set as well if you're like right okay I can't say yes to too many things today because I know I've got something big that's just that's good me. it can be a good way to think about that as well yeah that's a great idea to think a little holistically about what you have to give um, it feels so good to set a boundary too. I, my experience with boundaries, I'm just like you girls. I am a pleaser. Um, also I'm, I have this terrible twin, um, sister to being a pleaser, which is also, I'm an achiever. So I have this other voice going, just do it all, just pull it off. Like just make it magic for everybody. And like, you know, take on the burden and take on the responsibility. And it is a real beast to battle. But I can personally, I can think of times where I have just said clearly and plainly, um, I'm I'm going to be unable to do this this year, or this is the way I'm able to show up in this. And that's kind of my limit. Most people, this is not all, and I, I will make so much room for this not to be with response, but a lot of people are respectful of boundaries. They're not necessarily bad people. They're just throwing stuff against the wall like we all do. Like who can do that? And and being able to say, this isn't going to work for me. Most people are like, oh, okay, thanks for telling me. Like, all right, we'll, we'll accommodate for that or we'll we'll adjust or it's not the end of the world all the time is my point, um, oh, which sometimes and, boundaries feel like. And we can spiral internally, you know, prior to setting that boundary and come up with all these narratives of they're going to hate yeah. me forever and it's going to be the end of our relationship. It's going to be the worst thing in the world. And often yeah. they're like, okay, cool, no worries. And it's like, That's oh, right. All of that energy we have wasted, totally. oh stressing gosh. about nothing. <laughs> so real. I literally am telling myself this right this minute about something I'm doing. Oh, it's invented. Good. I'm telling myself a story yeah. about something that hasn't happened oh. and it's taking up a lot of energy. And <laughs> why am I, why? Why? Um, I would love to, um, just for a minute, get your perspective of what it means to be on the other side of that conversation. So, um, virtually everyone I know, if it's not their own story, they love someone who's grieving this year. Um, and so when somebody is on the other side of us and they are hurting and they're in a place of grief, we, there's nothing we want to do better then choose our words carefully and be a soft space to land. But we get this wrong a lot. Um, There's a lot of misunderstanding around what to do as somebody who loves a griever. Um, And so what, what would you say are a handful of responses that we can put in our pockets that do the right things that, that validate the other person's emotions that signal our support um, without 
the the wrong things, which is diminishing or whatever that are. Y'all just talk to me about here are the ways um, to respond to a griever that is really useful and meaningful. And maybe here are some ways that seem like they are, but aren't. We love this question. Okay. I think it's a tough job. It's a tough job supporting someone you love who is in deep pain. And I think often we just want to fix them and we can't. And so we offer up all these cliches and platitudes to try and make them feel better. But honestly, if there's anything that you take away from this conversation, please try to avoid saying platitudes. I will get into a few things that you can say instead, but things like you're so strong or you're so brave or another one that's really not great to hear is, you know, I can't imagine what you're going through. You know, I think you you can, everyone can sit there and imagine that, you know, and it kind of just really minimizes our experience when people tell us these platitudes as well. You know, we just want people to acknowledge what we're going through. And as grievers, we really appreciate realness. You know, it doesn't have to be anything flowery or poetic or, you know, my condolences. We can throw all that out the window and not overcomplicate it for ourselves. We just want something real. We want people to just acknowledge how terrible it is. You know, we want people to say, I am here for you. I am so incredibly sorry for what you're going through. You know, I, I wish that I could fix this, but I can't, but I'm, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Just be really real. And it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, too grand as well. I think totally. what else is helpful. Mm. You don't have to sound like a Hallmark card. Take that pressure yes. off yourself. We <laughs> don't need the sweetest sympathies. We just need, no. this is really, really tough. And I'm with That's you. lovely. And I think also, you know, that I can't imagine, like when people say that, that just separates you because, you know, you think, well, you probably can imagine. You just want to meet them where they're at. And active listening, just, you know, holding space is a term that gets thrown around a lot. But it basically means active listening, being present. Don't try and fix it because you, you can't. And not judging and just giving them, lending them a listening ear. And also talking about their person. If if they've lost somebody and they are and and, and they want to talk about their person, if they're if they're mentioning them, ask questions say their name you know show them that you're keeping their memory alive especially this time of year as well um just yeah just show them that you acknowledge that that their person is still alive in their heart and mind that can be really Mm. really powerful I love that I think that is such a lovely answer I've I've done that and I've borne witness to that before when someone's able to say can I tell you like my favorite memory about your mom and it they just light up like, yes, tell me. Or like one time your mom said something to me that I've never forgotten. Those are gold. Those are precious. Totally. And I think with grief or difficult things in life, we feel like our response needs to be this highly curated, you know, groundbreaking, yes. um, you know, res- response that's going to like fix everything. But no, just be real. No. Just yeah. be conversational. Thank you. Just, yeah. And you acknowledge anything. Acknowledge the loss. Hmm. You know, yes. people be surprised yeah. how much this actually doesn't happen. Oh you yeah, know? yeah, I yeah. Like, look over here. Woo woo. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> Instead yeah. of just looking at it in the face and going, God, it's the worst. Yeah. Um. This is a. It's this ancillary, but the the space in which you um lead and work is it's there's a lot of overlap because right now particularly around this time of year we see a lot of um seasonal depression and and even other like mental health issues as we head into the winter time like this is just a time where whatever might have been a kernel of sadness can tend to flourish in this, the fertile soil of the holidays. And so do you have any thoughts or tips or um, approaches to coping with essentially isolation and loneliness right now? Because they're major culprits stealing a lot of like joy and hope, particularly during this season. 
oh, it's loneliness is so hard, full stop, but especially during this season, like we spoke about earlier, when there's a sense of, you know, you're supposed to be happy or you're supposed to be connected and you're supposed to have a big, you know, there, there can be this idea of the big family Christmas and it's really isolating. And I think it can lead to mental ill health sometimes. So seeking professional help with big advocates for that. It's really important and there's no shame in it. Im and I have both reached out and had professional um, support when it comes to grief, loneliness, mental health. So first and foremost, that I would recommend that. But also, sometimes we don't feel like our best selves when we're grieving or coping with loss. And so it can be difficult to put yourself out there. But if you are feeling lonely, it, cause it, you can feel lonely even if you've got support because if you don't have somebody that acknowledges you and what you're going through that's where the loneliness can can really set in and Im and I met because we both felt that way so seeking support maybe it's online or maybe it's a local support group but seeing if you can try and connect with others who maybe are going through something similar if it's grief um, or if it's maybe even a hobby that you have, it doesn't have to be grief related, but trying to find others where you've got a commonality is really important. Um, but also processing your feelings of loneliness. So not only reaching out and connecting with others, but also maybe it's journaling or doing something that makes you feel connected to yourself, whether it's a hobby, um, Something that reminds you of things that you enjoy um, can just give a little bit of a lift as well. But connection is so key and it's not always easy, but there are lots of online support groups. You know, Good Morning is a really safe space as well to connect with other people going through loss. Um, Im, what would you add? Mm. Oh, they're great, great tips, Sal. But you're right, like connection, I think, is the antidote to loneliness. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think when when we met, when Sal and I met, we we had a lot of support, but we felt like no one truly understood or got what we were going through that was outside of our circle as well, because grief can impact everyone so differently, like we've already talked about, but that can really change the dynamics in families as well. So especially around Christmas time and all the families coming together, if you're all experiencing the same loss, everyone's coping so differently and it's often causing a lot of destruction within the family unit and then that can exacerbate those feelings of loneliness and isolation so it is really important to seek some support outside of your circle if that is something that you can relate to so Sal and I met through a support group perhaps there's an in-person grief support group in your local area online there's so many amazing grief communities online including ours where you can you know foster those connections with other people who understand grief because that's so important when you are grieving is to feel connected with other people who get it and that can really help I think with those feelings of of loneliness especially around the holiday season and I've got just another thought because it's really Mm -hmm. helped me and I think um like Im said connection is key but also like maybe it's volunteering, volunteering with, I volunteer every Christmas morning um, for a lunch for people who are homeless and it's giving back also something that's outside of you and your grief and you, but it's also a way to meet people. It's a way to connect. It's a sense of purpose. That can be a really good thing to do. If you are struggling, maybe it's volunteering an hour of your time and you might be surprised at how that does, does help. It's a bit of a a, a magic pill to some degree. And I don't mean it's a quick fix or a permanent one, but truly like generosity and service and turning it outward a little bit. um, It is a marvelous um, healing tool, honestly. And so thank you for adding that to the fray. And and the thing is, is we, those are all within our control. There's so many things that we don't get to control. We don't get to control how somebody responds. We don't get to control the words they say or don't say, but we do get to choose like who we reach for. And we do get, get to control. Will I serve somebody else in this season? And those things really matter. Um, even I really appreciated the idea of even if that meaningful connection is something we do to connect with ourselves, that also 
is a healing tool. That connection counts. Um, and so none easy, but all like really useful tips. I want to go back um, to something M that you said earlier. Um, you are mentioning um particularly that those first couple of years around this time that you felt among other things, besides not festive, you felt like a bit of a burden. And so I would love to hear both of you talk about that a little. What would you say to somebody who's afraid of being a downer, right? Or a burden around the holidays because grief has no timeline. It doesn't go on hiatus simply because it's a cheerful season, supposedly on the calendar. Like how, how do we end up um, not just owning, but respecting our own feelings, even if we have this sense, like this is going to be inconvenient or something for other people. Like, why can't I, I'm just not going to be able to put on a good face here. Like, I'd like to, for, to hear you talk a little bit more, if you could parse that out, um, because that's just real. That's just a true, that's a true statement. So somebody is listening to this going, oh, that's going to be me this year. That's going to oh. be me. I can, I can barely crack a smile, you know? Yeah. And feeling like a burden is such a horrible feeling. And firstly, I just want to say nobody is a burden. If you're grieving, you are not a burden, but I'd also just like to let anyone who is feeling that way know that grief is messy. It's so messy. It's up and down. It's a roller coaster of emotions. And we really, we are passionate about normalizing how messy it is to let people know that whatever they're feeling is actually really normal. You know, I, I was raging the whole first year of my grief. I was so angry, you know, and that's normal. But at the time I felt like there's something wrong with me. Oh, I haven't moved through the five stages of grief and I haven't got past anger yet. You know, grief is physical, it's emotional, it's a spiritual experience, it's a whole, it just changes your whole being. So practice self-compassion. You need to be so kind to yourself during this time. It's You need to remind yourself that it's okay to grieve, whether it's your first year or whether it's year 10 of your loss, it's okay to grieve, you know, especially during the festive season. And I just think we all really need to like give ourselves a little bit more compassion as grievers. We can be so hard on ourselves and we need to treat ourselves how we would treat a friend who is going through a difficult time. Like we need to be really gentle with ourselves and it's a practice and it's a learning, but yeah, self-compassion here is key. Sal, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I think it comes back to boundaries as well and clear communication. Mm. So if you are spending Christmas with others, just being honest with yourself, with others, like, hey, I'm really not feeling it this year. You know, I might, uh, you know, I might join in on some of the festivities, but I might keep my, you know, involvement a little bit um, scaled back. Or I just want you to know that I'm really struggling at the moment. And so I am struggling to get into the festive mood. I do still want to be a part of it, but I'm just letting you know. And making sure that you, again, aren't stretching yourself too thin or putting yourselves, yourself in situations where it might be draining, um, having that clear communication. Also, maybe limiting, like having boundaries with how much you, time you're spending on social media. Because I think if you really are struggling at Christmas and you are you know, you're feeling like, um, oh, well, it, you're feeling like a burden and you're not a burden, but if you are feeling that way, sometimes um, looking on social media, it can like exacerbate those feelings, you know? So maybe giving yourself a bit of a boundary around that too, but clear communication is key, but also just remembering, like Im said, self-compassion, you're not a burden. You just, you're just human. You're experiencing a really difficult thing. We all go through it you know? And if people don't respond well to you as well, like if you put in a boundary and somebody doesn't respond well, know that it's actually got nothing to do with you. It's about them, you know, because we can then go feel much worse if somebody doesn't respond in the way that we'd hoped as well, but it's to do with them. They're not, they haven't got the, the awareness to be able to meet you at that place yet. That's not on you. And so, yeah, I just think that's really important for people to know. Yeah. Don't Great take point. it on. 
Yeah. Great point. Uh, hell, that is a good point for all of us, regardless of whether we are grieving or not. When somebody doesn't respect any boundary at any time, for whatever reason, that's a, that has to do with them. Um, I want to ask one last question um, before I let you girls go. You're both at about the four-year mark here following your losses and so I'm just thinking about the person who's listening for whom this is fresh. This is new. This is 2023 for them. Um, and they're at the starting blocks. So I, I'd i love to just hear from both of you. Um, perhaps like just some parting words toward the grievers that are, that are early in their, in their process. Um, words of hope, words of possibility, um, recovery, whatever it means, whatever it has looked like for you, what you see in your whole community, because now you've got people in your community along every stage, um, for whom their loss was last week. And some, it was in like 1971. So, you know, you've got, you've got the gamut. So maybe just some hopeful words for the early grievers this year. I would like, there's so much that I would like to say, but I think know that you're not alone in this because like we said earlier, grief is so lonely, but you are not alone. There are lots of other people walking this path beside you and it does get easier over time. It won't always be the first and last thing on your mind, but if it is right now, that's also okay but just know you're not alone and and you can do this. You can get through this. We love giving some words of hope. So when I was in the early, I say months, but early years of grief, I my life felt so dark and I couldn't see any hope for the future. I had a, a new baby at the time and it was meant to be the most joyous time of my life and it just felt just horrendous. It was a, it was an absolute nightmare. And like Sal said, one day you will wake up. It won't be the first thought on your mind. That was something that was really important for me because for a long time I had so much trauma, but I would wake up and I couldn't think of anything else for the entire day from when I woke up until I went to bed, other than the fact that my mom was dead and it had just stuck the absolute life out of me. And I couldn't imagine ever waking up and that not being my first thought and as the years went by and I've, I've done the work, you know, I've done a lot of work on myself for my grief and my trauma, but I do, I wake up now and it's not the first thought. I think, oh, got to go get my daughter out of bed, got to get her ready for daycare. And it sounds simple, but it, I never thought that I would get there, but I just want anyone else to know if they are in those early months or years and they are feeling that way and there's no hope there is. And it does get easier to manage over time, I think. And it's just important. And I think hope as well. It's something that we have to actively seek out. You have to put a, a bit of a plan in place and be like, right, I can get there. Things will get a bit easier. You've got to kind of keep reminding yourself that as well. It's not something where we just wake up hopeful one morning. We actually have to do the work to to get there, but it is absolutely possible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And and to Sal's point, whoever's listening, you can do this. You're no less capable of recovery and hope than anybody else. And so I remember um, in the fall of 2020, I remember telling my sisters, and I meant it at the time, I thought it was true. I told my sisters, I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And I thought that was it. I thought, you know what, I'll, 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 I'll keep the wheels on. I'll figure out how to keep life moving. Um, I'll check on everybody else, but I will to some degree probably always be pretending. I'll I'll be this sad for the rest of my life. And lo and behold, here in 2023 at the end. Look at you now, Jen. Happiness. We're so happy for you. It happened. Oh. We do recover. We yeah. do. And I just have one other piece of advice, if that's okay, because yeah, it is something that's it. really helped me and I think it might help your listeners especially if you are struggling with loneliness um 
sometimes we want everyone to be that friend or that person that shows up for us and holds the space and asks us about how we're feeling emotionally and not everyone is that person and we can feel disappointed or like they're not being a good friend and I think remembering that different friends can wear different hats you might have a friend that is the emotional support person but they're not really that social or you might have a friend that doesn't check in on you emotionally or ask you the questions about your person but if you need help finding a great probate solicitor they're your person or you might have somebody that's really social and they might not show up for you every day but if you need a night out or you need to go to a good restaurant and take your mind off things they're your person so I think just thinking that different friends or different people in your life wear different hats that's okay that can really help alleviate loneliness and take some of that that pressure off the expectations we might think I just wanted to add that because I think it can be really helpful thank you for adding that and I love um, my listeners to hear that too as friends of grievers you, you can't be everything to anyone but you can be the one thing that you are so um play your note in the song and that's the best thing that you can do. And so I really appreciate you adding that in and just all of your content. Thank you for keeping your feet in the flames of grief on behalf of your community, on behalf of other people who are grieving and who are new to grief. And you could have just um, moved on to other pastures, but the fact that you stay in this work means so much to so many people. And it's such an, it's a lifeline, as you know, it's a lifeline. Um, when, when people are drowning and they can't find a sliver of light. And so I'm so delighted to have ever met you. And I'm so happy to continue to put you in front of my community, um, as trustworthy leaders through something as complicated, but also as common as grief. And so last question, you both have to answer it. And you answered it the first time, um, because I ask all my guests this, and you can answer this girls however you want. You can answer this in a very like earnest, like precious way. You can answer this in an absurd, ridiculous way. We get it all and we love it all. The question is what is saving your life right now? So let's start with you, Sal. What is saving my life right now? Um, I am going to be really honest and That's say due. <laughs> reality TV because life is really sure. busy at the moment yeah. and my brain is pretty uh, yeah. on most of the day. So a bit of mushy reality TV. Like I, I haven't started watching the new season of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, but uh, I am going to and I'm excited yeah. about it. Cue it up. <laughs> Cue it up. I appreciate that as somebody who's deep in the bag on The Golden Bachelor. And so what is that? I mean, look, listen, America <laughs> will give everybody a run for their money on trash television. Okay. Oh, the Bachelor, are you familiar with the Bachelor period? Yeah. The yeah. Golden Bachelor is the first season ever with older the Bachelor 72. Oh, and so it's oh God, all like older great. women. No, it is great. It is so great. It is so heartfelt. Like if ever you want to just like throw a shoe at the television when like a 22 year old in a previous season is like, I've been looking for love for so long. I'm like, no, you haven't. But these women, the widows and the, 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 uh, they'll break your heart in half. Like you're pulling for all of them. And so anyway, the golden bachelor, I oh cannot God. recommend I know what enough. I'm doing tonight. Thank <laughs> Yes. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. How about you, Em? Oh, can we petition for golden love Island? I'd be here for that. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Same. I would like to see that as well. <laughs> yes. You're on to something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, what uh, is mine? I would say, I can't remember what I said the first time all those years I ago. I should have gone back and looked. Yeah. That will be interesting to go back and listen. Uh, I'm going to go with a really simple breathing. Breathing is is what's getting me through. And that can look like either just tapping in and just making sure you're breathing properly or doing breath work as well, which I love. So if I'm feeling my nervous system is, you know, in overdrive, just whip out a little 10 minute breath work session and I'm feeling recalibrated. So that is getting me through. Something else Um, that is helping, sorry, um, because it might help your listeners as well, um, is I'm coming up to the four year anniversary for my mum. It's next week. And 
I'm holding a lot of grief in my body. And something that can help um, is that we hold a lot of grief and emotions in our lungs. And if you practice yin yoga, you can find some really simple sequences on YouTube. Um, yin yoga focused on the lungs can help just um, move through some of those emotions that are stored in the body. I find that really helpful as well. Oh, same. Thank you for both of you saying two sort of embodied practices to manage our grief and our central nervous system and our emotions. Those were all things that I learned post-divorce. The breath work, profound, just profound. I, I learned it in the context of um, guided meditations. And um, I had two important people in my life say, you've got to start this practice. And I was like, I, 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 I don't give me voodoo right now. Like I'm at the bottom of the ocean. And yet those practices of getting in my bones and in my body and in my lungs and in my breath, I, I think it's, I, that I'm an evangelist now, um, yeah. for that, it's those life practices, changing. life changing. Yeah. And literally self-regulatory. You can regulate your responses. It's crazy. It's powerful. Well, I don't know about you, Jen, but I was sort of walking around, never even, you know, ever thought about my nervous systems. I don't think we got taught about those, you know, and the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, like learning about our nervous systems has been absolutely game changing for us in terms of our grief. You know, I was definitely stuck in sympathetic overdrive. So that's fight or flight if people don't know the terms. And then you've got the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. So doing things like breath work can really take you out of that fight or flight and into a more calm and centered and grounded place in your body, which we all need to be in much more than we are. Yes. And it's a yes. time of year. Absolutely. <laughs> this is actual biological agency over our body our body and over our feelings and over our responses. It's incredibly powerful. Thank you for just zinging in that little um, gold gem here at the end. <laughs> um, all right, girls, can you just remind my listeners where to find you, where to find your book? Um, and if they would like to be a part of your community, which as mentioned is an incredibly safe space for grievers of all stripes. Yes. So you can find the Good Morning Grief podcast wherever you find your podcast. It's on all major platforms. Our book is called Good Morning, and that's morning with a U, Honest Conversations About Grief and Loss. And it's on Amazon in the States, uh, but tap it into Google and you should be able to find it. Um, and our website is goodmorning.com.au. We actually have a very exciting membership that we're opening up in early 2024. It's going to be peer support and a place to connect and find other grievers who maybe live in your area or um, who are experiencing a similar loss. So lots of things happening, but that's where you can find us. Great. You guys, what a good addition to your work put people in connection with each other where they live. Yes. That's so powerful. I mean, that's your story. So, um, well done. Good job. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, you guys, I'm so happy to see you as you can imagine. I'm sure I will have you back for a third time because I just so appreciate you both and your message and your way of holding space for people. And so, um, the happiest of holidays to both of you. And thank you so much for coming back on again. Thanks so much for having us back on again, Jen, and for connecting us with your wonderful community. Yeah. It's been so good to catch up and so amazing to see where you are at now after these couple of years as well. Absolutely glowing and it makes thank us you. feel so happy. So, so good thank to see you. you. Thanks, Jen. We absolutely love you and your audience and your community. So it's just been such a treat to talk to you again. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you can see why they are fan favorites around here. And I am so grateful for their, for them using their stories and alchemizing their own losses into something so lovely and so beautiful and useful for the community of grievers that is really called humans. So I'm going to have over at jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, this whole episode and the link. If you'd like to send this to somebody who's hurting this year that you love, or you can share it with your own community if you're hurting and you, this is your way of saying, I'm posting this. Um, this is shorthand for how I feel right now. And now everybody can understand me better. It's a good one to share at this time of year. 
Um, I'll also have all the links over there for their book and their community and their socials and all the ways that you can become more embedded in their work and in their community because they are truly delightful and wonderful and incredible resource. And so I'm just sending so much love to my listening community, um, all of you, every last one of you, particularly those of you who are grieving this year and for whom your losses feel compounded and exasperated in this season where supposedly everybody is merry and bright. So um, you have a space here in my community with your real feelings and your real stories and your real losses and your real emotions. And I want you to know that we love you. And we hope that in some tiny, tiny way, this episode has served you. All right, you guys love you all. See you next week. <laughs>